allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, Mrs. Treadway, if you do the roll call, please. <coughs> Gary Dunlop? Here. Joe Gittins? Here. Cheryl Hancock? Here. Jim Jagielinski? Here. Kate Mayer? Here. Tim Menninger? Here. Myself? Here. And Brianna Schwambauer? Here. Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda at this time? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I'll let... Kari and Christina pick that one. Any discussion? Seeing none. All of those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that you come forward and a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. So if you're here to speak on behalf, you can come forward to the, the um, microphones to my right. And you, oh, okay, good. Yes, please have a seat and then five minutes for each of you state your name address Hi, my name is Emmy Davis. This is Darian Underhill and Kylie Shams. We are eighth grade students at home in middle I am here to talk about our student representative Brianna Brianna comes to talk to us and finds out what we think as students We don't always have a voice on big decisions that are going on in our schools She invited board members into our schools to see how great our teachers and other school staff are and what we are learning we all like the idea of having our opinion being put in the, in the suggestion box and shared with people that make, make our decisions. Brianna is definitely a role model for me and I strive to be like her. Thank you, Brianna. Well, that was very nice, ladies. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward? Okay, then seeing none, we will move on to recognition and thank you. At this time, I would like to call Bob Bear, Emma Madsen, and Karen Coleman forward. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Coleman, who is, or Ms. Coleman, who is our gymnastics coach, and the young lady with her is Emma Matson. And I won't steal any of Ms. Coleman's thunder. I'll let her give all of the great information on Emma. Thank you. Um, I didn't know I was going to have any thunder to give until I walked in tonight. Um, so this is Emma, our newest WIAA State Division II vault champion. Emma has brought so much um, pride and stuff to the Holman School District and has just had a phenomenal um, senior year this year. She was, um, there were five opportunities for first team all conference and Emma, um, I'm proud to say, took all five first team all conference honors. Um, she was voted gymnast of the year for the Mississippi Valley Conference. Um, she was recognized in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for her contributions to the sport of gymnastics. Um, she was a leader, she was a team player, um, and we're just so very proud of her. In addition to her state championship, she was also fourth place on the podium on both bars and floor. So, Emma. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? No? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, it's my pleasure to just provide, to present you with this small token of recognition from the school board. And I also want to say I have the opportunity to judge you and officiate you. And you were such a pleasure. And it does kind of tug at our heart when we see those seniors go. And to cap it off with the, the championship is wonderful. So congratulations. And then there's one more, th oh, Bob. <laughs> At this point in time, I would like to introduce um, Nick Slesser, who is our Project Live instructor, and Bob Zitlow, and Carla Wyrock from the Zitlow Foundation to present a nice little check to Mr. Slesser and his Project Live students. Would you like your students to come up, too? Well, on behalf of the Ed Zitlow Education Fund, I would like to thank Nick Slusher, Brenda Sabota, and the other teachers and aides for your continued involvement in education of those in the special education department here at Holman High School. It takes a special love of children to commit your life to these special individuals. The Ed Zitlow Education Fund would like to donate to these great programs. Here's a check for $1,500 to be used for Project Live to further your program this year. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but Pam Oliver and Sandy Stoddard are the educational assistants in the program, so please come up here. They spend five days a week, all day, every day with these students as well, so I can't take all the credit. My students need that female touch, and they provide that. <laughs> For those of you that may not be aware of what Project LIV does. It's uh, LIV is an acronym for Lifelong Independence and in Vocational Education. It's for 18 to 21 year old young adults with special needs and the whole purpose is to help them transition in every area of life. There's no set curriculum. Everything is based on the individual needs of these students. Uh, we work hard. We play hard. It is an amazing program. We have a lot of fun. We sleep well at night. There's no doubt about that. But uh, no, the money that the Zillow Foundation, this is the second year that they provided it for us, it goes a long way because a big part of this program is budgeting, so we're smart with how we spend it. <coughs> and we utilize it um, to give them a cultural experience they otherwise would not have an opportunity to do. Uh, this year, we're going to take a trip up to the Twin Cities, and we're going to explore the light rail system. We're going to explore downtown Minneapolis. We'll probably go back to the Science Museum and take them to their very first IMAX 3D experience. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with it, but also we're going to pack in a heck of a lot of educational opportunities in there as well. At uh, this point in time, would any of my students like to say anything? Hi, I'm Andrea Clark, and I'm a first-year student with Project Live. I would like to say thank you to the Ed Zillow um, fundraiser and all that they do for Project Live, because I know it, it goes far with us, so I'd like to say thank you. Anybody else? Okay, before we pass it off, um, these are the students, Shan Tuvu, you can wave your hand so they know who it is, <laughs> Ashley Jenkins, Brady Dockendorf, Stella Stopa, Andrea Clark, and Michael Walsh, and we also have Danny Johan, who's not here tonight, unfortunately. Thank you very much.
It's an inside joke. I told you it was going to be a good night, didn't I? It's going to be a good night. Sure. Carla, back up here. Kind of I rock, and um, Mr. Zitlow will stay up here for one more presentation. And before they do that, I would like to introduce Brenda Swoboda. Brenda Swoboda is our transition coordinator who would, wrote a grant last year for some transitional activities for our special ed students. And one of her peers with her is Lori Volkman. And Mr. Zitlow is also helping them to fund a trip to Washington, D.C. for the first time for many of these young adults. So Brenda, Lori, thank you. We'd like to present you a check for $1,000 that will be used for your trip to Washington, D.C. to further our, our educate our lawmakers about the importance of Let's Get to Work program. So, and I would like to also thank the um, school board members, administration, teachers, and staff here at the Holman High School for all you do to enrich the lives of these special children, soon to be adults. As a community, we need to con continue to educate all the individuals the life skills needed to live a full life. So that's, that's our goal, to help you. So I'm going to let this young lady go ahead and introduce herself, and then we'll talk a little bit about our trip. No. <laughs> Can I tell him who it is? <laughs> This is Taylor, and we have another young man who in the back is going to be joining us, and three other students that weren't able to make it tonight. Um, but we, two years ago, uh, Lori and myself and Nikki Osgood wrote a grant. It's called the Let's Get to Work grant. And the goal of the grant is to increase employment outcomes for our younger youth who have significant disabilities. Um, as most of you know, um, our youth with disabilities are probably the most underemployed population that we have. So. Uh, we have done some fabulous things with this grant, and we're so grateful. Um, but then we got this experience, or this opportunity, to go to Washington. And I definitely want to thank Julie and Bob for approving it. It got approved, and I thought, oh, Lord, what did we do? <laughs> but um, a lot of our students have not traveled outside of Wisconsin, so this is going to be pretty an, an exceptional experience for them. Um, one of the, we'll have three days of kind of fast and furious Tour, or doing some touristy thing, but the biggest thing is we'll be going to the Capitol to talk about the importance of um, the support for programs to increase employment outcomes for our youth. Um, let's see, anything else we'd want to say? We are so excited, we go the first week in May, and we're taking a bus trip with, we were actually, it's not, the trip is not sponsored by the grant. We were just invited because of another school that we got to know through the grant. So hence our reason for fundraising. And um, Bob's donation. I don't know where we'd be without you guys, so thank you. Um, so we go the first week in May and we are super excited. Any questions? And since I have the mic, <laughs> <laughs> I too would just like to say a thank you to Brianna. Um, this last Wednesday was the National Awareness Day for um, bringing, bring aware bringing awareness to the, the, the misuse of the R word. So Brianna had some fantastic ideas. She jumped right on board like I've never seen. She emailed me all these great ideas. And even on our snow day, she was working. So because of Brianna's work and help with this, um, she helped us with our t-shirt sales, which also helped with the fundraiser. But if you go over to the high school, we have a ton of multicolored pledges that our students took to not only stop using the R word, but just to promote acceptance and diversity. So without Brianna, it, I don't think would have been that successful. So thank you. As they're taking that picture, every board meeting we have the opportunity to compliment and highlight ways that organizations and individuals in our 
community support the school district and the Ed Zitlow Foundation is another example of what makes Holman so great. So thank you to the foundation for your support. It really does make a difference and you can see that um, in this evening's presentation. So thank you very much. Then moving on to reports and discussions. Community collaboration, Lori Kessler and group. Well, thanks for having us back. If you remember, we were here about two months ago and we asked your permission to continue conversations about the idea of putting together a collaboration to get a facility that will serve more than just one population in our community and to also consider the use of school property. So Mary Lynn and Dan and I have been very busy in the last two months. <laughs> we promised you we'd bring back more information. We don't have all the answers yet, but we want to keep you posted on our progress. This is the first of four meetings this week. We're going to hit all of our potential partners so we get to practice with you. And Dan is not with us. Um, he is back down in Florida. Um, thankfully, his health got a little bit better for him to go back and to be able to spend a little more time down there. Um, however, we are going to kick off this with uh, what Dan left you with the last time, which is um, our opening slide that says, this will happen. <laughs> um, Dan requires Lori and I to call him after every time that we meet. <laughs> So we met four times last week. We made four calls to Dan last week. <laughs> then Dan called us in the weekend because he had a few questions. So he's continued to be very, very involved. He's here even when he's not here. Yeah. So. so just for the people in the audience, a little history. We know we've needed a place for our teenagers to go since 2006. We had a spot at Home and Lutheran Church. The Boys and Girls Club provided the programming. And we had 100 people attending. And, and we quickly outgrew the space. So I announced at a foundation breakfast last spring that this, the way we were doing it wasn't working very well. So we started a new direction. Dan McHugh then entered the picture, answered my plea. He then got Mary Lynn on board, and we've been meeting since May of 2012. And that's when things have been getting pretty interesting in continuing the conversations with, with additional partners. So we've taken a new direction. One of the things that we challenge ourselves is we, re we really challenge ourselves to think about what is it we're trying to accomplish. Yes, we were trying to accomplish initially um, making sure that we were trying to find a space for young people to be able to gather. So we asked ourselves some very difficult questions. Is there space to relocate? Um, the school or the church was no longer an option. Could an existing building in the area be purchased to, to be used? Um, we had the conversation about St. Elizabeth's that was on the market. We had the conversation. Um, we asked ourselves, how much space does a teen center really need? Um, we did our research on that. We found out that many, many people suggest that your minimum space should be about 16,000 square feet. Um, even if we found the space, we started asking ourselves, now that we've found the space, who's going to run this? Um, we asked ourselves, should it be a standalone structure? Or, and if so, where do we build it in this community? Um, what happens if the, the, we build a building and five years from now, it can't be sustained. Now, if we do that, we have to say, now we're stuck with trying to sell and get rid of, getting rid of a building. And so then when they really came down to is we started saying, who's really responsible for ensuring that the Holman area teens have a place to go? And then the big question we asked was, <laughs> what on earth did we get ourselves into? <laughs> because as you started looking at answering some of those questions, it became very, very obvious that if we were going to make the commitment the commitment had to be one that we could persevere with. So our next step was going out and talking to people. So we talked with people who knew what they were doing already. So with Boys and Girls Clubs, we talked. With the YMCA, we mentioned that before. They have a good teen program down in La Crosse in conjunction with Gunderson Lutheran. And they both have said they're willing to partner with us at least um, to have initial conversations. We went and visited other places, Sparta, Black River Falls. We visited other locations. We looked at other collaborative community models and there's a lot out there. So when we get to the part about who's going to run what and who's going to do what, we have some great models to follow. We also challenged each other to think outside the box because if we wanted to do this, we wanted to make it something we could really be proud of. And it's here where we sort of left you after we did our initial presentation. What we asked the last time we met with you was Give us permission to keep thinking. Give us permission to keep brainstorming. Give us permission to be able to see how we might go about accomplishing this. And one of the things that we did is we really took some time thinking about how quickly the space was outgrown when it was at the Lutheran Church. So one of the things you want to do in that regard is we wanted to make sure we weren't going to be diving into something and creating something that was going to be a five-year Band-Aid. 
something that was going to be easily outgrown or that we couldn't sustain. So we started to take a look at are there other things that can happen inside of a building that's built as a teen center that could help sustain the life of that building and give that building a 24-7 opportunity to be available to be used. And so we found out quickly that the village has been looking for the possibility of expanding its senior nutrition center. This community clamors for gym space constantly. There's always a need for gym space. We, we heard that there were places where they were outgrowing the activities and the spaces for clubs and organizations to meet. We found that, that we were hoping that maybe we could find some instructional spaces for certain areas for the school to be able to take uh, some opportunities. We, of course, wanted to make sure we were committed to the teen center. We wanted to make sure that we took a look at was the possibility that maybe it could become more of a community center. We looked to see whether or not we could have fitness and wellness programs. We continued and we found endless, endless possibilities to the extent that for a short period of time, we almost got lost in our own energy <laughs> because you start to hear of everything that the community says we wish we could have. And being the type A people that we are, we started saying, maybe we could put that in. Maybe we could put that in. Maybe we had a really big place And for we a finally while. had to pull ourselves back and say, wait a minute, we got started here to build a place for young people to go. So let's get ourselves reframed and refocused. So we went back to the idea of what a teen center would need. And they need a place to relax, a media space, a gym, music, uh, a place to study, programming space, kitchen space. And then we decided, OK, if the kids need all that space, who else might use that same space to share that? So that's when we got the ideas of other people. So we did some modest searching. We invited some people in to bring some more ideas to see if we could create a sustainable facility, we wanted to know what else might possibly be married to a teen center. And the ideas that we had, we heard from the village of Holman, we heard from the town of Onalaska, the chairman of both the town of Onalaska and the town of Holland. We've talked to the YMCA to be able, to, again, to piggyback on all of their experiences, the Boys and Girls Club, Gunderson Lutheran, and we talked to La Crosse County, who has given us a great deal of indication that they long for spaces up here to be able specifically to be able to address some of their needs to provide services for aging and disability services. And we're on the agenda for lots of those meetings in that group of people. Those are the potential partners we were talking about. So we know we have lots of needs and here are some of the ideas that we heard for how could that space be used. So we don't need to go through them all but there's stuff for seniors, stuff for kids, tutoring space, aging and disability, that teen mental health part that we talked about so much last time that we know that there's an, a desperate need for that. All these things that the youth could use, not just the school youth, but um, for not just the teens after school, but, but everybody, ACT prep, all those kinds of things. Just relaxation and organizational clubs, so all kinds of things that could be used. And again, we just hit a little bit. So it started as a teen center, turned into a what if. And in these next three slides, you will see what has almost become our mission. What if a community came together and all the invested parties agreed to form a collaborative partnership that not only would meet the needs of an initially identified population, but would also so enhance the Holman area so that the outcome would meet the needs of the identified, of the entire identified area. What if we created a one-of-a-kind community center through a first-of-its-kind community collaboration that not only let our kids know that they were welcome here, but that the entire Holman area was welcome here? And finally, we asked ourselves, what if that collaboration could stand as a first-of-its-kind to include a village of Holman, the school district of Holman, the town of Holland, the town of Onalaska, private and public partners and organizations, community clubs, businesses, and organizations with private donors. And that's what it looks like if we all work together. And so we've done a lot of background and research, but what we found as we've continued the conversations is it's hard for some people to wrap around what this might look like conceptually if you don't have some visuals. So with the gracious help of Ron Knappmiller and Doug Ramsey, we've created some simple mock-ups and some simple ideas. 
we want to make sure we preface this with saying this is not the finished product. This is not these three folks have created something that we're going to build tomorrow. This is simply to give us. We, yeah, we, <laughs> we could if you want. <laughs> yeah, if you have somebody with a great big checkbook. Um, this is for people to begin to conceptualize what this possibility could look like if we bring all these people together to create an, a community center that would be able to possibly be used 24 7. So here's one of our ideas. So remember we asked you about using school land and we looked at all the buildings, talked to John Daly and came up with this site. So here's the current high school and it's an overview. When I looked at everything I could get my hands on as far as long range planning, all of the long range planning went out a different direction. So this is a direction that goes towards the football field. So if you can get your bearings there, that's an overview of what that would look like. That's like um, 20,000 square feet addition. I think roughly right. 20,000 square feet. So it's right across from the um, entrance to the stadium. It's on a corner that right now, um, as it sits, is mostly green space. So then we ask them to do like a mock-up of what it would look like 3D, and that's just a little bit of that. And then there it is with all the people. <laughs> nice warm <laughs> welcomings. Yeah, and then knowing about the programming space, we kn we did two different arrangements, and it was so gracious that Doug and Ron did that. So there's a gym space, there's multi-use um, space, gathering space, a community room that can seat a hundred people. And just know that as we as we came up with the ideas, what we did not do is we did not ask Ron and Doug to say just draw us a picture. Everything that's put on there is in response to a programmatic need we identified. So it was not build a shell and let's fill it up. It was we have identified specific programmatic needs that can be met from both the, not only the teens but also from the community and potentially um, from the school. But here, here's another version of that that you know it could be used lots of ways. So after more conversations, more input put, it could be changed. So. Those are the drawings. All right, so if you're looking at all those things and we're really saying, okay, everybody can use it, we just did a typical day. So at 7 a.m. we could see seniors walking around that track while one of our community organizations has a meeting. Then the alternative program could meet from 8 to 2.30 with their classes while the high school kids or the adaptive PE classes or everyday PE classes took some time in the gym. The seniors could run their nutrition center from 11 to 2 and have a blood pressure screening. After school, we could have seniors and college students tutoring our students. The kids could practice in the gym. We know all the teams need more time. From 3 to 9, we could have the teen center with all of the activities that they need. At night, the community and municipalities could use it and 4-H groups. And then more people can walk and we can keep things going. Oh, sorry. I kind of jumped there. And so the, the thing about that we, when we put it together, one of the things that conceptually in our mind is this is a standalone addition to the high school so what that means is it has a separate entrance it does not require that if it's used on a weekend that we would have to have the need to have the high school open to be able to take care of it separate entrances separate exits um, that also helps facilitate being able to make sure that it's used for the purposes that it's designed to use for but it's, it's designed to be a standalone so there's still lots of things to do and we know that so we know we need to finalize all of our programming. I can't read that very well. Finalize the potential partner investments. We need to develop a collaboration guideline. We need to develop the legal framework that can be embraced by all the partners. We need to finalize architectural designs. We need to finalize construction costs and timelines. We need to develop operational cost projections for at least three years out. Um, and lastly, we need to prepare and execute the fundraising plan. And then We're giving you only a teeny, teeny tip of where we are. We know we aren't anywhere close to being ready at this point in time. And then the last big one, if we can pull all this together, um, is to make this happen. That's Dan. We had to put him in there. Yeah. <laughs> so we know all these things are steps we have to take care of, and we intend to do that within the coming weeks. Um, but we want to leave you with these thoughts. The time has come where we can no longer point the figure and say, let them figure it out. Our future rests in the commitment we make to our young people, 
in the shared experiences of those who have been here for a while, and in the promises our families are offering their children today. Our goal is not to fix the past. We can't do that. We can't go back and fix what happened in the past. Our goal is instead to create a future, a future where we stop putting ourselves, our organizations, and our entities into sacred boxes that say, it's not my problem. So we're here tonight to tell you that we hope the time has come to hold hands and say we're in this together. And to do that, we need you on our team. So now we're going to ask you for what we, what we need again is a willingness from you to commit to continued conversations. Can you think about ways your organization can contribute to this dream? And would you be willing to identify someone from your group to continue these conversations? And when you think about that person, we're looking for someone who understands the needs of not only young people, but other entities in the home and community. Be confident in representing your interests and someone who really believes in what we're doing. So we'd love to hear from you. We've, um, we've met a lot. We've put in a boatload of hours. Um, but we think this community and our kids are worth it. Um, we are committed. Um, I've said a number of times, the need for the young people in this community to have a place to go has been a need this community has talked about since the Golden Palace shut its doors. And the want has been there. Fortunately, we've had some people who have, been, who have stepped up to fill it for a, sh for a period of time. Um, but there's not a space big enough to be able to go through there. We have to find a way to be able to finally accomplish what we've been talking about for 20 years in this community. Um, and I think we're at the point where we're saying, um, we'll stay the course to be able to get this done, but if we don't get this done now, um, it's, it'll be real curious to see what happens. Um, Ron Knapmiller is here to help answer any preliminary questions with us this evening, but this time we're more than willing to um, be challenged by you, to be supported by you, please, <laughs> um, um, and to be able to um, answer any questions you might have about where we're going, where we're heading, and any holes that you see that we're missing. Okay, then and bringing that back to the board, I think if we just, could you put the questions back up there, Mary Lynn? Those? The three? Yep. Can you oh. commit to the continued conversations? So, uh, you know, I'd like to maybe just have a conversation. We're not voting on this tonight. This isn't on a um, consensus. But just to have conversation around those three questions. Is, is this something that we see as a board um, to continue to have a conversation and I think you know, support sure. this. Mm -hmm. I think it's an awesome use of the space. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I'm so, sorry. What, you, I said it's an awesome use of the space and bringing the partnership together mm -hmm. uh, with the high school. You know, as a school district, you know, it, it you know, really helps these kids, which, you know, I today was excited to see a bunch of these yeah. meetings and yeah. they came yeah. out to a boring school yeah. meeting. Yeah. So, <laughs> they, you know, if they're coming to meetings, imagine what they do with something like right. this. Right. I think that's <laughs> it's tremendous. And then to see the gym space in there too, knowing the need for that, I mean, that really partners well with everybody. Mm -hmm. So then the brainstorming ways for our organization to contribute to this. Obviously, they've looked at space on school land. And obviously, we aren't voting and making any of those kind of <coughs> solid commitments. But I would think that that would be the first and foremost thing that we could look at is providing the land for this. Mm -hmm. Are there others, though? I think that's the obvious one. But are there others? Are, they, are you considering uh, for funding for this? Is it, is it going to be like pay as you go or um, organizations uh, contributing to the funding or pay, you know, yeah, I think we, we, haven't, we haven't mapped that out. What we're really looking for is if we can get a representative from every organization that, that will contribute or will be a part of this, then we're going to have a neutral facilitator to kind of map out, okay, how, what legal ramifications do we have to think about? What, so, so then you'll have a rep from your group working with someone, mapping out something that, in Dan's words, everybody will get something, but no one will get everything that they need, which is exactly what a collaboration is. So um, we think having a neutral party to, to talk through that, and we, we've got some ideas about who would be really great at that. So we think those folks can hammer out that, then we can come back to you with more detailed information, and then I think you know you decide to take action or not. So we, you know, we know we're far from having you make any kind of big decisions. And it, we, we've had the conversation about the, it, it would be one thing to say, let's get the commitment for the dollars to build the structure. 
but realistically we need to have the dollars to be able to um, meet you know some projected operating costs at least for several years to allow those collaborating partners to figure out how can we sustain this um, in a way where we aren't all selling pies and, and hot dogs to try to make sure that we can keep a site director. Um, we, because we've done quite a bit of, of research with other facilities, we have an approximate idea of what we would probably need for staff. Um, you know, as a school district, you probably can come up with some rough ideas of, you know, that kind of space in a school building costs X number of dollars for electricity, whatever, those kinds of things. But whatever we do fundraising wise, would include some amount set aside for the initial operational costs. So then there is that potential for the board sharing with operational costs, certainly in exchange for use of the gymnasium and other spaces that you talked about during the day that mm -hmm. the teen center wouldn't utilize. Um, what are some other? We are, I mean, we aren't in any way trying to lock anybody in right, right now. But I'm I think, just trying to do some right. brainstorming. Yep. Well, so, and are there so ways that you aren't spending additional dollars, but reallocating something right. that you already spend with programs, different places? You know that we we don't we know that no one can do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. So we even talked about it. One of ours could could the kids help clean up every night? Could we put one team in charge of this and for this month and that month? And we there's nothing wrong with going back to ideas like that where the kids take care of things and we really make it be their place too i mean we and we love the idea of having the nutrition site next to your campus because it's an amazingly powerful group of people to be able to come in and act as mentors or to be able to provide some tutorial services you know have lunch finish your lunch go for a walk around the walking track and then oh by the way we have a young man who uh, just needs a little assistance with um, some math, you know, you're a former accountant, can you sit down and, or, or whatever, you know, it may be, or, or it's just a matter of somebody needing some love, you know, sometimes it's a matter of just having a relationship. So what other ways does the board think we could possibly look at, though, as far as um, the three questions? I think it'd be really cool to give students the opportunity to be leaders in different areas of it. You could even open up the student representative position to be a type of um, mm -hmm. organizing position within mm -hmm. the community center mm -hmm. or um, just using different, uh, you could have kind of a facilitating club where mm -hmm. you could get different proactive students in the NHS wow. maybe or um, different areas to get involved and, and that might help with some of the costs with mm -hmm. staff mm -hmm. too and would be provide a good opportunity for kids great idea you know the deca group would like to get in all the way up to their ears I'm yeah. <laughs> there, you go. there you go and you guys can talk among yourselves and, and get back yep. to us too and think about that we don't mean to take up time for everybody well, else i think but having you here though i mean okay. it, it, my hometown that i'm always very proud of cashton currently is going to referendum and part of their 12 million dollar referendum is a $3 million community center yeah, for their school there. district. So it's like, this is, yeah, yeah. They, it's a health center. They got the grant that we got in the physical education department and they used that to bring in fitness equipment for mm -hmm. a rural community. It was really something, but they've got people working out in the hallways and in the cafeteria and then having to move it. So, you know, that is something that I've wondered about because we do get state aided on mm -hmm. some of those kind of things at least putting it out there for the possibility that we look at that and you know the other entities mm -hmm. the townships and the mm -hmm. village we right. would want them to come to the the table obviously with some right. support too if, and we're still in, still going out to private donors i mean right. we've got we're going to do that too so and then the last question was about who um identify someone were you looking for someone from the um, staffing perspective or a school board person or what were you I was thinking the school board yep. I think that's I think we're, 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 we're hoping that as we finish with both of the students. townships um, tomorrow and Wednesday and with the village on Thursday that we will then we would then have a representative from all four partners to be able to sit and help hammer out the all those technical things that really don't belong in a volunteer group right here um, you know it's somebody who, who has knowledge and can represent you know your your own investment and so we were hoping to have someone come from the town board each of the town boards 
um, to have the village identify someone from their village board so that it could be someone that could be a liaison to go back and forth to be able to share how we continue to grow this. Okay. Well, if any board member has interests, let me know. I know I have participated with this group for a while, but would be interested in hearing from other board members. I would say that, as is our process, this will probably go to our facilities, okay. uh, buildings, and grounds committee. Um, and it probably would be an appropriate time now that we've seen some drawings and that sort okay. of thing to continue to have that conversation. I think that we, I know you have a lot of dreaming to do, which is a good thing, but we also want to take care of some of that initial sure. discussion because um, we've heard about it for a long time about the gym space and that need, and that's been there, and you know, other potential for. Um, district facilities and that sort of thing so okay. it's do you need something from us to send to that facility committee? they may I'll let the facility chair uh, maybe have you come in and do a presentation to okay them is my guess, okay so all right <clears throat> Ms. Kessler have you tried contacting the Cooley Region United Educators Association not yet okay <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put it on my list <laughs> Wonderful. I, I just wanted to say I really appreciate the visuals because I'm such a visual learner. And to see that corner of the building facing the entrance to the stadium and to picture that, and to picture the walking track, and to have Mary Lynn describe, to, you know, the people walking and the senior meals and helping the kids with, that's, that helps me a lot. Oh, good. I it, mean, I'm all yeah. in, but to yeah. actually picture <laughs> that, that's just amazing. It just blows me away. And like you said, we're not all in our own separate little boxes, no. and we can't. We can't compartmentalize our own little entities anymore. We're all we're so global and we're so interconnected. We have to work together because we're all our resources are so sparse. We have to work together. And this but is if, just if you get into the, the cool. sort of the devil of the of the detail of, of some of those interior designs, why um, Ron and, and and Doug have put in um, the opportunity for more accordion type walls or pocket type walls so that you know what might be a smaller space can become a bigger space and you can just you can adjust and move things to be able to make things um, usable for multiple multiple different types of disciplines so, so maybe you guys could all go to your town board meeting tomorrow night <laughs> or Wednesday <laughs> or Thursday that'd be great are you doing the village this week yes we do all yes. four it was, okay. it's so four you nights just in a row go. this week <laughs> Be well, great. thank you. Okay. If you want to send us the your schedule for this week, we will pass that on to the Okay, board. we'll do right. it. What night is Town of Holland? Town of Holland is Wednesday. We have personnel and governance. Oh, we do, yep. Town of Alaska is tomorrow night. Village of Holman is Thursday. Thank and the you. nice part about doing all four in the week is that all of the entities are getting the same information in the same week. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, ladies. All right, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you Mr. Nat Miller nice to see you thank, thank you. you so we'll move right on to self studies the art department if the faculty would like to come forward and share that information with us I see Wendy coming as well You don't have to sit. That's she's got a mic for you. But if you want to, I'll sit. Okay. Um, we are the art department. Um, on behalf of us, we like to thank Dr. Carlson for allowing us to come back. We understand it. Um, our self study was presented by Wendy. And um, you didn't see a whole lot of us here, actually none of us. So we had a miscommunication, um, I'll take the blame for that. So we apologize, but he allowed us to come back. We're gonna try not to uh, repeat too much of what Wendy said. It's gonna be short and sweet. We're here for questions and that probably mo mostly. And would you introduce yourself for the public? We know you, Matt. But... Okay, I'm Matthew Langrick. Uh, I teach at the middle school and... Jen Grass, I teach at Evergreen. You got the mic. She's got the mic. <laughs> I'm Amy Wink. I teach at Prairie View. This is Jenny. Oh, I'm sorry. Jenny Stage. I'm at Sand Lake. Marcy Tosher. I travel to Elementary. 
And Amanda Kerrigan is at the middle school. She wasn't feeling good tonight, so she's not here. Thank you. So that's us. There we go. Um, as probably Wendy said, we the way we collected data was um, we did a survey with um, staff, with students, with what's the other one? Peers. Peers. Yeah, that sounds good. And um, we had an external evaluation um, where um, we had Marsha Thompson come in. She's a um, ex um, art teacher, many years. She works with um, student teachers from the university. And we also had site visits where we went to several um, middle schools, elementary schools, high schools, saw how they were conducting their art classes and how they had budgets and all that stuff that goes along with that. And from that, um, we looked at the data, looked at, you know, broke it down, and we came up with um, overall strengths that we thought that the outside um, observer looked at our departments and said what were our overall strengths, what we think we're doing well right now. And we also came up with um, then from these three outside sources, opportunities for improvement, which you know we found out we all have areas to improve on. And how we broke it down was by elementary, middle school, and high school. So what we're gonna have is um, Jen's gonna talk about the elementary strengths and then the improvements, and then the middle school strengths and improvements high school strengths and improvements, and that's how we just broke it down in the slides. All right, again, I'd like to thank the board for giving us their time tonight. Um, also, Matt and Wendy for their hard work on getting this health study organized. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, on with the strengths, um, our, one of our top things that um, our evaluator noticed was that our artwork from each student is always on display. And I think as a group, we just really value that it motivates our students and it helps us to recognize their efforts. So it's something that we uh, believe is really important. Uh, we do it around our building. We also have done it at the public library. We have an annual pump house show. Um, we get the students involved in different contests and in different, I think through the different buildings, uh, special opportunities for kids to do a little bit more in the art room. <clears throat> Uh, one of the other strengths was adequate space and materials, and I just want to say that I, I believe having our own rooms is essential for our, our program, and that it is why um, in Holman the elementary program is strong. Uh, collaboration between all of the teachers. Um, I think with the early release, uh, our collaboration has improved considerably over the years. Uh, we just started up a wiki um, with the help of Marcy, who is our probably our tech support. <laughs> uh, if, if she wouldn't be here, we probably wouldn't have been able to get that going. So thanks, Marcy. And um, the wiki has allowed us to um, kind of align it with our curriculum so that we've been able to develop PowerPoints and resources that we can now share. Um, uh, it's another thing that she noticed too is that we refer to the curriculum for our lessons. Uh, I do believe that we have a very strong curriculum. Uh, it was written under the leadership of Amy, <clears throat> Amy Wink, and um, I believe it's a really strong foundation for us in the future. So um, as we continue to write it in the next year, I believe we really already have a strong document, and we will be uh, adding on to that as we, we feel that it will improve our, uh, <laughs> improve our area. <laughs> Um, areas that we can improve. Uh, one of the areas is budget per student. Um, it's not equal between the buildings, so that's one area that she had noticed, and it's a, it, a discussion that we've had. And we would like to see it where every student in the district that's in the R program receives the same allotted amount. Um, and I'm not really sure how budgets are decided amongst the buildings, but that just seems, with the fluctuating numbers, that that would make sense. Um, one way that we have <clears throat> uh, helped our program to allow us to do I, more things and have the materials that we need, uh, we've developed, or we've, each building has had a fundraiser every year. I think we've been doing it for about eight years. Is that right? Somewhere in there. Um, and that has really supplemented um, our materials and, and just the opportunities that we're able to bring to students. Um, Another area for improvement is uh, the course load is not even at each building. Uh, every year it's kind of a little bit different. 
but we would like to just see it to be more consistent so that each teacher at the different buildings is pretty equal. When you say course load, are you talking about class size? No, actually um, actual classes, so number, number of, classes of classes per teacher, yep. Um, <laughs> and if there's anything else you guys want to add, I don't know. Uh, technology in the different buildings is uh, different. It's improved a little bit. I think our fundraiser has let us purchase some items on our own, which has really been useful and helpful. Um, but that's one area that we would still like to see improved. Um, our traveling teacher has it a little bit harder because she's going from building to building and she doesn't have the same resources that we have. So that's elementary. Oops. Uh oh. <laughs> I go back. That's wrong. Yeah, there it is. All right, sorry about that. Just the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, the middle school, we, we looked at our strengths, and, um, and this came specifically from the um, outside um, observer and from the surveys. We took it specifically from there, and we thought that frequent collaboration between our teachers was strong. It's a little easier for us at the middle school because we have one big, huge art room, and we have two art teachers in it, so we each teach on one half of the room, um, no wall in between. So we might have 60 kids in there at one time. So we do collaborate of course a lot because we are in the same room um, the curriculum of course is the exact same on either side no matter which art teacher they get so I think that's a strength that they saw and um, we we have pretty strong parent communication via newsletter we send a newsletter out with the um, middle school every month so and we don't miss it and we put down what each grade is doing we try to get the support from the parents through that newsletter and let them know what's going on with our program um, staff is they, they thought the staff was flexible and works well with other content areas we tried to do a lot of collaboration with like the sciences and the, um, social studies especially social studies where we have a gallery in the middle school so we try to bring them into our gallery possibly tie our curriculum in with what they're doing in their classes which kind of ties it all together so they can connect um, we we have 93 percent of the middle school students take art and um, we have approximately about 70 students in our gallery club this year. So we have a high volume of um, students that are in our class. In eighth grade, they get to choose if they take art. And we have um, a high number that take art in eighth grade. Um, sixth and seventh grade, they all are required to take art every other day for a semester. So that helps our program and keeps them focused on shooting to the high school, taking art there. But there were some room for improvements. Um, we found out through the survey that um, our budget per student is lowest in the district. Um, probably in the last five years, our, our budget has been cut in half and our student population has went up. We have like 860 some students, I think, at the middle school, roughly. And um, over the last five years, it's went from, it's, 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 it basically got cut in half and a little bit below that. And we continue to get more students. So that's something that we've had to deal with and try to work around. Um, we do have, um, in our room, we have a half of um, half our room is has a computer lab just for the art department. So half the curriculum is done on the um, computers. So that's getting a little tight where you know that technology gets a little old, and then we have to keep updating. We've been pretty lucky with the school district; they've worked pretty well with us. But our fear is that down the road, you know, money's getting tighter. Um, we we did start a website. Um, actually, we had our seventh grade students make us a website last year in business class, and um, they did a great job, but um, that was a room for improvement for Amanda and myself, is we haven't kept it up as well as we should, so that was definitely a, a need for improvement for um, parent communication. And we also have low display, we do have a gallery at the middle school where we have a show every year, every month, I'm sorry, but we don't have a lot of display cases or areas to display artwork at the middle school. So that's something else that we are looking into so we can get our student work out there for people to see. I think it's hard to walk into any building in the district without noticing how talented our students are. Um, and then we have a gallery also that uh, displays 
talents of our art students and numerous other areas. And uh, collaboration between the art teachers, once again with the early release, that helps. And consistently referring to a document that's usable and uh, teacher friendly. That's another strength that we all seem to have. Uh, let's see, improvements. Uh, uh, the need to replace some of the technology, as you can imagine how outdated that becomes quickly. Uh, ceramics cla classes are overcrowded and limited storage with, uh, with any area, same thing, you can imagine how that would be. And uh, create a foundation of level courses for all students. Oh, that, that was an improvement that uh, someone thought we could make and um, that would just open up other areas like fibers, um, printmaking, you know, just introduce some of those areas to the students before they uh, choose the avenue that they'd like to be interested in. And uh, create a graphic, is that one on here? A graphic yeah, design? Graphic okay. Design. Animation, film, photography course with a focus on fine art and elements and principles. So that's, that would be our recommendations. Uh, some of the other art activities that we have at the elementary school every year at each of the buildings we have an artist in residence um, we also I'm sure you've noticed that the homecoming parade we always have homecoming floats represented by each of the elementary schools that the students are involved in creating um, we have a artist of the year award that goes out every year at each building where a student's artwork is chosen and framed and it stays uh, hanging in the building until the student graduates and then we also have various contests and various other opportunities for students, I think, just across the board in the different elementary buildings that aren't necessarily identical. So, um, so if you have any other questions for us, we'd be happy to answer them. And at the middle school? <laughs> we'll get back. It's okay. Um, we have a Midwest um, Gifted and Talented Network Middle School Art Festival that we send like six kids to every year that's the top left and then top right you see we have a every year at, at the holidays we have an installation where we turn our gallery into like an environment this year we turned it into the um village of home in in the years 1910 i think it was so it was like walking down main street of home and how it looked in 1910 and then we have a little shop in there that kids can purchase gifts for their um parents friends relatives Bottom left, we this is a student um, actually working last year's show, which was um, the Whoville, um, the Grinch, I guess it was. And um, they were making the installation, painting a big mural that goes in the gallery. And then the top, and then the bottom right, you just see some of our students plastering each other's face with um, plaster. That's one of the projects we do in seventh grade, so that just shows the activities that go on and actually the space that we work in there. <coughs> At the high school, um, we have the art club, which puts on the Halloween ball, very well attended. Everyone loves that one. You can see some kids enjoying themselves there with this year's ball. Um, our club tries to take a field trip to Chicago. Um, we're hoping to do that next spring. We'll have to see. We're trying to coordinate it. It's always so many activities, it's tough to coordinate it. Um, the Empty Bowls event is a huge event for us. Um, once again, this year, we were very successful and able to give the We Care Home and Area Food Pantry $1,200, so um, that's always something that takes us months and the kids are very involved in that. Um, the f Junior Federal Duck Stamp is something that we can be very proud of. We've had a number of kids that have won the state out of approximately 800 to 900 kids that entered in the state of Wisconsin, they won that. I moved on to nationals, some is placed as high as sixth place nationally. So that's an astounding accomplishment. And then there's a picture of the gallery that we have. And that's something that we try to keep open, have monthly shows representing even alumni from past years, of course. Those artists are out in the you know, field still doing their artwork, and that's wonderful to see. And with that, again, we thank you for not, um, allowing us to come back. And as Jen says, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask her. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? I just had a couple of questions. Um, just. Um, the middle school art budget, why was it cut in half? Or less I guess they needed it somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it just got, it went from two teachers down to one teacher. 
which cut it a little bit, but then they brought a second teacher back, and it went up a little bit, but then it's just continuously every year taking a cut. So it's 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 probably it's down half within the last probably five years. So I don't I don't know. I mean I I imagine they need it somewhere else. And that's a building budget. Yeah. Entity, so. I mean, I mean, Mr. Vogler's. I mean, he's worked well with us, helped us out when he can, but I think he's probably cut across the board. So, by half, and it's been half. I guess we were maybe too lucky at the beginning. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just wondering about the um, the improvement note you made under the elementary art teacher um, about the traveling teacher and the smaller course load. Is that? Is that something that would be addressed next year? I guess I'm not sure who to ask that of, but like be picking up more? yeah, that was just a note for um, notes for improvement or. Well, and isn't the self-study the first part of the curriculum, and then so what they'll do is they'll take the information from the self-study and then it moves on to the next uh, next step which then <clears throat> is it the curriculum council then that looks at the recommendations yeah, ultimately this uh, typically uh, the curriculum priest will be returning to the board eventually so I I don't have the timetable um, available but next May. Next, May. next May okay and just for, um, we do have a couple of our teachers, one's 0.75 and one's 0.8. So I mean, for a couple of these things that the high school thought about offering, we probably have the staff here to do those improvements, but of course they'd have to be bumped up to full time and I'm sure they'd probably accept that. <laughs> and so when a committee, and this isn't just art, this is in general, when we have a self-study then we've identified through the research and the self-study areas for improvement then is that determined based on what is would be good recommendations or is it determined based on what we can afford to pay for and I think Dr. Carlson and I'm well there's a number in uh, Ms. Savasky if you want to add feel free but there's a number of pieces to this typically um, some of the curriculum writing and revisions but also how that gets into staffing and personnel is is related but also uh, a little bit of a separate conversation or, or discussion as well or planning so there's a, a whether it's classroom space and and building usage and and uh, so there's a number of pieces that you can see on the recommendation that have to come together and and honestly for us um going to visit other schools, I feel very comfortable saying that our art department is equal to all of them, if not more progressive. And I think we've really pushed a 21st century kind of idea with technology, with trying to go K through 12. So we just don't want to go backwards. And when we start to feel like we're going backwards, we you know, kind of put our feet down and say, you know, we're, we really want to push it forward and you know, represent home and well. And that's why some of the recommendations are in there yeah, they might involve adding a class here or there, but I think it's pushing us the direction I think the home and school district probably wants us to go. And that's why I think there's an important step in this self-study, and that's sharing, once they've done all this work, sharing with their principals before they come to curriculum council and before it comes to you, to build that awareness of what they're finding with recommendations so it can be in the back of their minds as they're planning for buildings and for our district. So the, the question then, again, I'm thinking procedural, is then we have the self-study, it's done by the, the faculty, and then would they be the ones to, to have that discussion with building administrators at all levels, but then after, upon completion of that, come back to the board with the recommendations um, for additions and then I know in your budget you help pay for some of those resources because it's a new it may be a new curriculum and so it's not out of the general fund where those dollars come but it's out of the mm -hmm. instructional fund so just to clarify I know for Kate and 
Brianna. Okay. Thank I wanna, you. I wanna thank you oh. all, but I also wanna recognize Ms. Wink for um, helping the Prairie View girls do the American Girl Contest that you're working on. I think that's fabulous, and I know my girls are excited, so I appreciate that. Oh. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. I want to thank all back. of you for coming back. We yeah. missed you last time, and I'm really glad to hear. Yeah, we were at a little, like we were a little lost that night. I like hearing <laughs> the excitement directly from you. And then world language. Good evening and thanks again we, we're very happy to be back and I can't think of a better night to be back oh my gosh Emma Madsen a state champion our special education students in Project Live Brianna gets accolades beyond belief and we've had numerous conversations throughout the years um, I, I want to be in their art classes yeah. <laughs> um, but so, before you move on would you have each group of your yes I will member introduce um, I'm Carrie Burgum I teach Spanish at the high school Jennifer Olivares, Spanish at the high school. Brian Wopat, French at the high school. Lislot Coster, French at the high school. Justin Horva, French middle school. And Miriam um, Larson is Spanish at the middle school and Chris Kruger is Spanish at the high school um, and they were not able to be here tonight. Uh, when we were here last time, um, Wendy had given you our recommendations based on our self-study. <coughs> I sent out after um, we had a, we invited Dr. Carlson to come in and have a conversation with us. He laid out some points that he or he suggested that we write out some points to include in his notes to give you guys. And that was when we sent the paragraph that just said, "Hey, we'd like to come back." <laughs> um, and so after meeting with um, Mr. Vogler and Mr. Um, Bear this week, a week ago Monday at 6:30 in the morning on a Monday, um, we came up with the document that um, was sent out to you in your packet. Some of this stuff is repeated. Uh, basically, like we told you last time, we're coming from the idea of the um, district vision and mission statements um, of educating every student to achieve global success and educate and inspire students today and prepare them for tomorrow by ensuring that all students learn at high levels, developing the following 21st century skills, innovation, creativity, collaboration, communication, initiative, problem solving, critical thinking, leadership, self-direction, responsibility, interpersonal skills, cross-cultural skills, and computer and media <coughs> literacy. Achieving a deeply held partnership with the entire community, um, operating and acting in a fiscally responsible manner while ensuring well-rounded educational experiences. And when I listen to Lori and Mary Lynn, I'm thinking we could teach a Spanish and a French class and um, all sorts of things in that new community center in the evening. I just Wow, just excited. Um, it seems community runs a, a, a strong theme in a lot of what we're doing lately. We also had the three data co collection um, methods, um, our parent and staff student survey. Um, as I explained last time, or quickly briefed you, we had a great time. I mean, we had um, staff take it, um, students take it. Uh, if it wasn't for Lisa Rich at the middle school and each of us manning a lab at the high school, I think we were able to get almost every single person on our random list to take that survey. Uh, the only, you know, we would like to obviously get the community better, um, but we had that at, um, we sent it out via an email blast. So um, hopefully we'll get people more interested in that, just, uh, not just us, but anyone sending out surveys that we value their opinion. Um, that'll probably, that's one of the things in, communicating with the, um, the community that we would like them to understand that we value what they have to say and what they have to think. Um, our second group were our focus groups and that's the one where with lots of chocolate we got people in to come and chat with us. Um, our most chatty bunch were our middle school students. Um, they're wonderful. We, we had high school students, we had staff, we had administration. Um, we had a, a meeting um, with, and I apologize, Kathy Hawkins was a is a retired um, French teacher from La Crosse School District, and she was our um, external evaluator. She came in and just, we had that all organized all day long, and people came and offered their opinions, and within that packet of the self-study, 
you have all of Kathy's report. And our last one were that members of the group went to, the middle school teachers went to La Crosse and Alaska middle schools and high school went to Wisconsin Rapids and Stevens Point. And then we, they collaborated on putting those reports together with recommendations and comparisons. Um, as a whole, in number three, recommendations from us, implement a consistent scope and sequence that completes a 616 world language program, offer a dual credit 201 level course at the high school, offer an advanced course of high school levels two through four, um, require a minimum of two years world language study for students to graduate, offer both skinny and black courses for students, Educa educate our parents and community members about the importance of the world language of world language and make connections with local businesses to advise world language learners in regards to post-secondary career readiness and that last one comes through on a number of our different recommendations only because as you hear our governor talk about making people career ready not just college ready but career ready um, I know that there are numerous um, Spanish speakers in a number of the different factory areas in the Sparta area and the Arcadia area down around Norwalk um, so getting our kids ready for who aren't going to do that our waffle, waffle convention that we talked about last time that our principals have um, our principal and um, assistant principal at the high school have always been very supportive and, and have never said no that we can't go to last time I was able to be at the awards dinner and talk to a young man who teaches in Rochelle Rochelle he's the only Spanish teacher the only world language teacher and he works his curriculum around the farmer and wow I was like wow we had a really interesting conversation because he doesn't have all of his students going to college he makes his right his his world language around the farmer which helps them with the migrant workers and um, just other things in general. Um, another thing that we um, talked about with Mr. Bear and Mr. Vogler was working on that um, middle school where their six, seven, and two semesters of eighth grade world language would equal um, one year at the high school. We would like that to be required after discussion with them. Uh, Mr. Vogler doesn't believe that it would be to the best advantage of the middle school student to require two semesters at the eighth grade level. One is a fear that we would lose students. Um, the other is um, that maybe they're not ready to make an entire commitment that way. So we would want the ones who are willing to make that commitment. He also talked about involving the academy that they use over there to get those students ready to take that test. Um, so he's got some ideas over there that will be a continued discussion um, that we will have um, as our self-study continues and as we write that curriculum. Um, we have talked and we've talked about it for a while. Um, it was actually Miriam Larson's idea uh, to create testimonials on personal experience in regards to world languages. Um, Ms. Jagodinsky has said it here tonight um, that she likes to see the excitement. Well, if she likes to see it, imagine that other little kids would like to see their favorite basketball player, their favorite football player, their favorite singer from the high school saying, wow, I love French. Um, I had four years of Spanish. This is what you should do, you know, those types of things to get them fired up. Um, so we're a little bit, that's one of our focuses. Um, Brian's great with the flip cam, so now we just have to get the kids. Plus, we have a number of our former graduates who are doing some incredible things with world language that came out of our classes. Um, a lot of them actually taking it and majoring in it and not necessarily to teach but to work on a broader scale. So very excited about those types of things. But if we could have them come back over a break and do that same thing with a, um, a testimonial. All the world language staff um, provided financial support to attend the State of Wisconsin World Language Annual Professional Development Conference, which is our Waffle Conference. Again, cannot say enough about the support that we get from our high school principal, um, who all of them throughout my whole entire career who have done that and Miss Savasky like I said who picked up the um, the day session this year on Thursday um, dealing with the Common Core um, we are currently working to show how we support the Common Core Actful which is the national organization already has it laid out for world language how we fit into the Common Core and what we can do to enhance language arts and science and social studies um, with those types of things as we continue to look at things, middle school guarantees an opportunity for students to complete level, world, um, level one in world language curriculum through middle school courses. 
Um, right now, they have to choose to do that. Um, they're not forced to do that. They're not forced into a particular method of class or making them make a commitment that maybe they want out of later. Right now, it's a choice. One of the things that in our discussion with the principals that came out, uh, Mr. Vogler invited the world language team from the high school to come over and meet with seventh graders to explain why it would be advantageous for them to do both semesters of a committed world language um, if they really wanted to excel. And I think that's a great idea. Again, that one-to-one -one conversation, um, I think that would do wonders for them. Um, purchase of document cameras for each classroom, um, suitable headsets with microphones, and then updated textbooks and supplemental materials. Again, I've stated it um, a number of times, our highest priority is that recommendation of the alignment with the middle school. Currently, um, it's not going to be required and as we continue that discussion, uh, maybe we can figure it out how we can get them more committed, um, meaning students more committed to seeing the value of what they could actually get accomplished at the middle school so that they can do more at the high school. Um, other work being done to bring recommendations to a yay or nay or continue to work on connections at the collegiate level for our students. Um, we're not just talking youth options, we're talking that equivalent of that 201. Um, Continued discussion of requiring a world language for graduation and making our students globally prepared. Um, this was an idea that, that Mr. Wopat had, and then after visiting Stevens Point, literally with what, within 24 hours? He got an email from the teacher they observed saying the school board had approved it being a, required, a requirement for graduation. Um, in discussion with Mr. Bear right now, that would have to go to um, the um, credit committee and right now that's not looking at restructuring, but it's not off the table. I mean, he didn't tell me, absolutely not, pounding his fist, no, he didn't say that. Just said that something that's part of the discussion, we'll just keep having the discussion. Consistent grading policy at the high school, we're working on that. This is the first semester where we have our grading policy, every single teacher is doing as the exact percentage on every single thing. So it's, it's kind of cool. It'll be interesting to talk about it at the end of the um, semester. Um, implementation of technology that's beneficial and moves our students forward. Again, I'm going to be the guilty party. I'm the one who needs to learn. Uh, I don't have a really pretty PowerPoint, and I apologize. Um, and I have, I think, I've sworn up and down that my department has paid my fourth hour. But I have a smart board that I am very slowly learning how to use. But they're like, why are you using an overhead? You have a smart board. I, I think Jen <laughs> paid them. But anywho. Um, Updating our textbooks and supplementing materials. Um, again, here's that making contact with the local businesses to get their outlook on world language learning. <coughs> um, the Rotary came in, talked to the high school on one of our in-services. They provided us with a list of people to contact. We need to use the list. Mm -hmm. um, and the fifth one that I added that wasn't part of it before, again, currently all middle school students who take sixth, seventh, and two semesters in the eighth grade of the same world language can take the placement exam or test out of level one um, at the high school. They have to commit to that second semester of eighth grade. If they don't, they're not prepared. Therefore, the gap classes. And in registering for this upcoming year, there weren't the numbers to provide the gap classes. They will still continue to be on the list. Um, but again, we need a certain number to take them. But they are available. And currently, our communication with our um, community, we make sure that there's a, a little foreign, a world language blurb in our um, high school newsletter. You know, it gets some questions answered, it gets some contact. Um, the best thing I can say, a lot of work, and not, not regrettably so, not regrettably so at all. Um, they, Matt gave kudos to a woman on their committee who, if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have the, the wiki. Well, if it wasn't for Brian for a lot of the technology things, you know, we wouldn't have that. And he um, took this self-study and put it together. And um, I'm very, very grateful for that part of it. Um, in fact, uh, if you hear me yell in the hallway, it's Brian, come help with the computer. So, um, you know, I th thank you for that. Um, the appendices have much research. And as we found out in discussion with Mr. Vogler, some of those even are outdated already. I mean, it's just constantly changing. Um, with best practice to support, our, to support our recommendations, yes, we're the experts, but none of it gets accomplished without the positive attitude 
support and work environment that we have here in the Holman School District. I've already stated about the, the meeting. Um, Ms. Savasky was there as well. Uh, 6.30 in the morning, <laughs> we really wanted to meet with everybody. So um, we're continually grateful that people are willing to support us. Um, there's no doubt we want it all. But I was listening when Lori Kessler said, and I believe Mr. McHugh is the one who stated it, that everyone gets a little bit of what they want. You don't always get everything that you want, but if you work together and collaborate, you can get a, a bigger picture. So I, I think that's where we're at. Um, of course, we're disappointed that we can't have it all, but <laughs> we're gonna keep working. You know, I, Dr. Carlson hasn't said since the last meeting he had all that extra money for me yet, so I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but any questions? Any questions? Um, yeah, is part of, it, and I'm, I'm new, so, but as part of this, as, as your, you are our experts, and so every time you come forward and you tell us what state of the art is for world language, and then, and of course there are barriers set up, but is there like a, with the whole vision we have, for global awareness for our kids is do we ever talk about like a five-year plan so okay maybe it can't happen next year maybe the recommendations that you give or <laughs> things that you feel um, looking at for example like the middle school kids and what they should have um, and how much they should have and making the commitment is there is there a five-year plan with all our district committees where we can find a way to start getting some of the things that we know are best practices in there to look for them. Um, I know a few of my daughters went through the West Salem uh, school system where, where it's, it's a way different <laughs> look there in terms of middle school. And what my daughters exited with in middle school, I've got to say, was much stronger than what my Holman <laughs> kids exited with in middle school. It made a huge difference huge difference the, their background their knowledge by the time they went to high school well so I guess that's one question is is I'd like I'd like some time to see rather than just maybe always hearing what we can't do this year well what what's the timeline you know we can't just keep saying no I don't think um, because either because that's the way it's done all the time or or a schedule or different attitudes and I I want to relook at these issues because I think they are important and I think they're such a value to global languages, world language, uh, for a school district's reputation. I think it's more than more than can than I can even state. That's how important I think it is. And and with that said, we've heard for decades that children should be learning this sooner and sooner and sooner and sooner. And yet districts across the state don't seem to grab that and I'll be quiet now but <laughs> the five-year plan that's what I'm wondering can we relook at all of this again can we test it sometime well part of that would have to be um, in constant conversation and Wendy this is actually the first time where we were told to discuss those recommendations with our building principals I have not, as long as I've done this this is my fourth time of presenting a curriculum and I have never gone to my principal prior to this and said, okay, yay or nay. And so uh, Bob and I talked about it and he said, you know, Carrie, I can't go with this one right now, but he said, it doesn't mean it's off the table. Let's continue discussing it. Um, the same thing in the discussion the other day with Ryan and Ms. Savasky, I know it seems like it's not gonna happen and I just don't ever wanna believe that. Um, I believe that, and Ryan has stated that, that he is in support of what we do. He just has to think of a broader picture. And right now, he can't tell them to require, well, he isn't telling them to require world language. I do fear if that becomes a requirement of students opting, you know what, I don't want to commit for a whole year. That part of it does bother me. At the same time, I know that when they only, when they come in, and I've used this to describe it for years, just enough to be dangerous. They cause discipline problems. Um, they are bored. And so we've really tried hard to make sure that 
they go through and, and commit all the way through to that. Because to give them a test that they've only gone through the first semester at eighth grade is unfair. I mean, you're setting them up to fail. And so at that point, we don't administer that test to people, who, to the young people who have not completed those semesters. I know that doesn't answer your question of a five-year plan. I would imagine that would be a discussion that Dr. Carlson and the, the building principals would have to have, and Wendy, with regard to the curriculum self-studies in general, not just ours, but all of them. Exactly, yes, yeah, and so you were kind of the first two I've experienced. So. Right, well, so, and Dr. Yes, Carlson and I even spoke about the fact that he would like to have you people all updated on the process mm -hmm. because some of you are new, some of this is the first time you've gone through that, um, some have only gone through it last year, so it's not like there's a lot of familiarity with it. But he just had said, what about doing, you know, an, a, another presentation that isn't necessarily, here's the finished product, but we've done this and this and this, and this is what we're working for. Part of um, the recommendations on the, on the whole document were those gap classes. We've already been in front of you and you've already approved of them. So, you know, we're moving in that direction to accomplish what we can do as a department with the blessing of um, the building principal. And I think, you know, eventually, I, I, can't, I can't see it any other way, that we will have that requirement that we need at the middle school. Um, I'm, I'm with you, Kate. I, I hope that that's a five-year plan, that we can look at that at least to find an option that would fulfill that, either a summer school thing, right within the eighth grade model, I, I, don't, I don't know, or the middle school model, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. You guys have any brilliant ideas? No. Can I just share real quick about the five-year plan with the recommendations that are before you, with the, the recommendations with any, that is the work in their time in between their next curriculum cycle. So the committee still stays intact, and they are to be meeting and working towards those recommendations within you know, the next seven to 10 years when they come back. I think what's happened, too, in the past, mm -hmm. in my conversation with Dr. Carlson, and I do recall some of this, where we would have curriculum groups that do meet, they do the, the self-study, and then they bring some great and wonderful recommendations to us, however, some of those could be are, were attainable and others weren't, and the ones who weren't sort of got just dropped, and there wasn't that continuation of looking at them. And uh, you know, it there is a difference in that it was the district who said these are the things we want to see. Okay, go out and make it work. But other things um, were just absolutely not attainable. It was done based on interest, so new classes, those sorts of things. That's when they were starting to come to us. And if there wasn't enough interest, then the classes never went, and then you know it got, they got lost by the side. So I think the idea of let's look at what is attainable right now, but always keeping those other things in the back burner going and moving. And so this sort of is a five-year plan um, of what the needs are because it will start all over the next time they do a self-study and is it five years or seven years when they every it it was seven years but with resources we are stretched out to more more than ten because some things will be funded through her budget tools and curriculum and and textbooks if necessary or online you know those sorts of things the hard part is always the staffing part of it to um, add staffing if we're not taking away from someplace but just adding and where do you get those resources not that I like that system but that that's kind of where we're at right now so. but thank you very much for coming appreciate it and it is a good idea maybe we should although we've had an opportunity to hear how the process works. If you have other questions, we could have Wendy come back and maybe go through that process with us, but I think you've been helping us learn the process along, mm -hmm. along the way too, so. So thank you. Thank you very thank you. much, thank all you. of you. Then moving on, educator effectiveness.
This came out of our Personnel and Governance Committee. Just asked Wendy to come and give the group a short update on where um, educator effectiveness is moving and what we've been doing in the district to bring that along. Well, thank you very much and good evening. As Cheryl said, I'm just going to plan or just talk to you about how the district is going about planning for educator effectiveness. So why educator effectiveness? Well, research again and again <coughs> shows that it's the educator that truly impacts student achievement. And it's not just the effective classroom teacher, it is also the effective building principal. So our goal in the district is to complete or create a system that encourages and supports all teachers and leaders so that student achievement will be our focus. So how are we getting there? We have an educator assessment committee. This is a cross-representational group of educators from each building and administrators in the district that are working on this committee collaboratively together. And the next few slides are a draft of our timeline. This first section of our timeline is truly about building knowledge about what is educator effectiveness, um, what are good practices, what are good models, and what we will have to do in our district. This next set of timeline is really then starting to create the systems or build the systems as far as training, staff development, um, identifying technology needs, identifying a pilot group, and so on. And then this summer, once the pilot group is identified, there will be staff development for evaluators and the pilot participants so that mm -hmm. in September we may implement a pilot of an educator effectiveness model. Then next school year, we'll be reviewing the model, troubleshooting, learning as we go, continuing updating our educators and you as a board, and continuing then to plan what will this look like when we go full scale in the district. And then depending on which model we choose, you know, training from May to September of 2014 so that we may start full implementation in the 2014-15 school year. And that's educator effectiveness in a nutshell. And when she talks about the models, I think it's important to know that there is a cost yes, that there is. is attributed to those. Yes, wow. there is a cost. Right now, there are two models in the state. There's the CISA 6 model and the DPI model. Both of them are pretty equal in cost, um, but tentatively about $80 a teacher plus initial charges, or $80 an educator, I should say, because it includes everybody. So, And currently in the governor's proposed budget, there is that piece in the budget proposed, which is encouraging. And the piece for the $80, but not for the staff development. Correct. That Thank will you. be in addition to it. That will be out of our funds. And you had an estimate of how much staff development? Um, be between, I mean, it, the entire staff and the number of hours that each model is recommending would be um, close to or above $30,000. So for staff development, which is pretty, pretty huge. And the models, depending what happens with the state budget, are a little over $30,000 too. But if it does get covered under the state budget, we're hoping. And this is a mixture. The, the graph is a mixture of what we currently evaluate now. Right. So the SLOs, which is student learning outcomes, so mm -hmm. some measured tests and assessments, and then also some SMART goals. Right. Um, and it could be different at the high school. They're looking at graduation rates, those sorts of things, where at the other levels, 
other indicators are being used. Right. And back, I think in August, I shared a pie chart where 50 percent of an educator's evaluation will be similar to their evaluation now, which will be on practice, and the other 50 percent will be on student learning outcomes, which could be, as Cheryl mentioned, the SLOs, how students perform on the Smarter Balance or the WKCE exam, local exams, graduation rate, um, attainment of eighth grade math, and attainment of third grade reading. And the district has 2.5% that we can choose, so which will be part of the discussion of this committee too, what that 2.5% will be. And building administrators also will be evaluated using this model. The exact same way, yes. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Sure. And I think you're up again for continuous improvement progress. Definitely. The switch between PowerPoints. So back in September, or I believe it was October, I presented each building's goals just as an update. They are in your packets this evening. But tonight is just to give you an update what they're doing to achieve their goals. So important to bring this slide out because this is our strategic objective and keeping our eye on, you know, our goal is very important. As a district, we have seven SMART goals related to student learning, and I highlighted in black just kind of the key, the key measures, and you'll notice that the measures do cover all of our grades from K through 11. Um, so we do need to, you know, down the road, think about a pre-K as a goal within there too, but you will see some, some probably inroads in the future slides. So, Continuous improvement is definitely a roadmap, and it's the changes that buildings and departments put in place so that they can improve student achievement. At the district level, we have been working on three major strategies, and they are disciplinary literacy. The Common Core State Standards have English language arts standards for all content areas. And one thing that is amazing with it, and as we're learning this year, is that for each content area, you read differently. So if you're a social studies um, person or a teacher, it's looking at social studies with the eyes of a historian and looking at it to see is there bias who wrote this. Um, and social studies folks are really looking at how can I argue with this piece. Also then with professional learning and communities really focused on the Common Core State Standards and learning more, developing units of study based on the Common Core State Standards and also common summative assessments. And the last district goal is response to students' learning and developmental needs. We know that students learn at all different paces and this is to help us meet the needs of all students and also looking at our students in those typical areas where achievement gaps are realized. So our early childhood pre-K, they this year in their professional learning communities are creating a resource map and also creating revisions to their current progress report. Last year our pre-K early childhood teachers started doing a progress report similar to the report cards that all students get. Then their professional learning right now the the teachers are taking part in a book study which is offered for UWL credit on creative curriculum which is a resource that they use within their program. And they're also then creating professional development and sharing of forms. And you'll notice the student assessment piece at the bottom, just looking at ways that they can also track the progress of their students developmentally and academically with the speed dial and the ASQ SE. Evergreen Elementary School has been focused on differentiated instruction. 
their staff meetings are have that focus where each grade level presents something on differentiation at each staff meeting. They are also developing a framework for implementing differentiated strategies. And looking more closely, we have a district resource map for interventions, but they're looking more closely at their building and creating that, inter that resource map so that building-wide, they know what interventions work for different types of student deficits, but also then who is trained in the intervention and how to use the intervention. Prairie View has a staff learning focus. There's staff meetings. You'll notice the topics that I've put in parentheses, but included in theirs are peer observations where they observe peers within their classroom. They've observed peers in other classrooms in the district, and they've also visited a classroom in La Crosse and professional learning communities also working on Common Core State Standards and Common Formative Assessments. Sand Lake Elementary, you'll see a, a common thread looking at differentiated instruction, which is key because, again, our students are at different places, so we need to look at multiple ways of meeting all their needs. Recently, Brian had a speaker from a, or a retired reading specialists come in and share um, the gradual release model, which is a way to scaffold students' learning. They are also building a framework and a system to ensure that the peer observation are really focused on professional learning. Viking Elementary has initiated monthly data meetings where each grade level looks at data and then look specifically by name, by need for each student. Their PLCs are meeting more often to work on the Common Core. Staff development, they've participated as, as all district staff on Common Core work days. Um, during their staff meetings, they're also focused on the Common Core and they've had support from Doug during their staff meetings also. And again, creating those common formative and common summative assessments, and they are now taking new steps in PBIS so that they can get to a further stage in implementation. <coughs> Holman Middle School, they too are meeting more often. I know that Doug is meeting with the math group four days a week and really learning about the Common Core Standards and what does it mean for math instruction, and similar is happening across the building. They are the first building to start in Tier 2 of PBIS, which has been a huge undertaking for them, but it's been an exciting journey. They've learned tons along the way, and as our other buildings get to that point, and I know in our, in our PBIS meetings, we constantly debrief on where they're going, what they've done, so that we can learn from them also. And they have really been working extremely hard on their additional support and extension piece for responding to student needs. And that is very evident, I know, from when Ryan came and spoke with you about the new middle school schedule and the work that they have done. Can you talk about high school? <laughs> so, so the high school this year has implemented very regular formative assessments, and their formative assessments really lead their Viking 20. Do you want to talk about Viking 20? Viking 20 was one of our ways to help teachers start to implement increased and more efficient differentiation for our, for our students. Um, we started the year off making it pretty prescriptive as to it's, t it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's for 20 minutes, and and what we've done now is we're starting to work a little bit more with the teachers. Is we don't want it to be so prescriptive. We want them to do the differentiation as needed. Um, so when they come and speak to either myself, Mr. Weber, or Miss Lindquist, we're we're um, willing to differentiate a little bit and, and not make it quite so prescriptive. It. Um, it's it's new. We've had our ups and downs. We we we've tweaked it as we've gone, and we look 
at tweaking it also for the upcoming school year for um, helping to meet the needs of our students and, and our teachers. So in differentiated in instruction, they are also as a high school doing a book study on Dr. Nunley's book on differentiation. And the book is really focused on what does differentiation look like at a high school level. Anything else you want to say about the book? Well, last week at our staff meeting, we dealt with a, a teach the way I was taught. And it deals with how we were taught how to teach when we were in college. And for those of us that are a little bit um, more experienced, <laughs> a little bit more gray hair, those methods don't work quite so well with, the, with all of the um, things we're trying to accomplish within the differentiated instruction. So we're trying to open the doors a little bit and, and, and change things. So that's everything we have for you this evening. Any questions? Um, I have a quick comment. Sure. That's okay. Um, looking at all the different things that we're doing um, for educator, educator effectiveness and um, improvement of instruction, it's, it's great to see in theory. Um, and it's awesome to see that we're caring to put in these programs to help um, improve the way people teach. But this is a lot of stuff that teachers need to do. And I'm going to be honest. It's not fun to be a teacher anymore. Um, people I've talked to, it's getting hard. It's not always a place that they enjoy coming to. And I think what one of our biggest focuses needs to be over the next couple of years, especially with Common Core, and especially when we have um, all this teacher effectiveness coming down the pike here, is focusing on our teacher morale and making sure that they know that they are appreciated and that we're giving them the time to really develop their own curriculum, to personalize it more instead of having it so structured. And I understand the reason we have it structured, but... <laughs> Brianna, that's part of their Just, Common Core work days at this time where the teachers are not only building a deeper knowledge of what's in the Common Core, but they're developing their curriculum. They're getting that time to do that instead of doing it in addition to teaching a full day because it is tiring. And, yeah. and I, our elementary teachers who are doing it all, reading and math, I, they have their roller skates on and unfortunately <coughs> There's accountability piece that's all tied into this, so we want to make sure that our kids are ready, but and our teachers. So, quite honestly, I think you know I agree, Brianna. However, there are things that the state, this this um, educator effectiveness. I think we had a pretty robust um, evaluation system in the district. It's something that we really don't have any question choice in the matter. So, unfortunately, but. I, I think we all hear you and we would love to just be able to focus on those common core standards but there's that accountability part that's going with it so we've got to do our best to um, to do it however you know I heard once from a, a state elected official saying school districts just don't express their concern enough well that was pre 2011 I think when we saw um, people being very quiet and quietly accepting this kind of stuff but it's it is unfortunate, but I am sure we'll do a great job at it because of the staff dedication, both administration and our teaching staff on the, with the boots on the ground kind of thing. So, but thank you for your thoughts. Then moving on to Salu Care contract for occupational therapy services, Julie. Hello. Um, in your packet, you have a contract for Salucare Rehabilitative Services with an issue paper. Um, just a little description of that um, in addition to what you have in your packet. Um, each year we contract with Salucare Rehabilitative Services for Occupational Therapy. 
the cost that you see on there represents two um, registered occupational therapists and two um, certified occupational therapy assistants. Uh, they serve about 90 students in our district right now and um, they do a phenomenal job for us um, and um, I'm asking that you consider that contract and um, approve that contract at the next meeting. Um, I'm here to answer any questions if there's anything you need to know about that additional or uh, is it something I said everybody's leaving? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the hour is just getting late no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was full before. <laughs> But I, I can answer any questions if you have any questions about that. Well, yes, if can you can. remind have. us what last year's amount? This represents a 5% increase from last year. Um, you know, I, every year I look at that and I think, wow, um, what, how good are they really? And um, I, I'm here to tell you they are amazing with our students. They are part of our district. Um, they do a, a wonderful job. Um, I don't have any reservations about um, renewing this contract. Do we have to go out on bids on this at this level for services? Can somebody help me with it's that? Just, yeah. <clears throat> it's not something that we've done, but Jay? Well, that's what I was going to say when it comes to uh, personal services mm -hmm. uh, where you're not really bur purchasing a commodity but you're purchasing the person we have not consistently done that um, well we do for the audit and some of those other things I mean even banking we ask them for it's just not something for this year because of the timing of it but it may not hurt to to so look at that this would be comparable um, we'll be coming in April or so with our CESA um, agreement as well so we have a couple different organizations that we contract mm -hmm. with so it'd be comparable to that as well any other questions <clears throat> historically have we hired our own staff in the past for this role or have we always contracted out <clears throat> I don't have a year I know that this has been boy Kari I don't have a, a number of years Certainly during my time, we've been with this, this agreement or this contract. We used to, I think, have a multiple, multi-year agreement with Salute Care that we have moved away from that the last couple of years to one year, and then it's kind of a mutual as far as renewing. Um, so it has been, I just don't have the years. We certainly can go back and look for that. I'm just curious if we've ever looked at hiring our own staff in lieu of this and the financial advantages of that or disadvantages I don't I don't know if we've ever done that I just look at that at that cost amount and I think of hiring four people um, with their salary benefits and all those kinds of things um, I don't I don't know um, by hiring through a company like this they're responsible for all of that and um, we don't incur the cost of, of the benefit package. We simply pay that dollar amount and that's it um, for their service. So um, what, we've never done that. I don't know that we've done that. Yeah, one of, yeah. I guess it may be an advantage is that some of these areas, some of these unique needs um, may fluctuate from year to year. And we're making a commitment for a year if you have your own staffing, it might be uh, kind of up and down, up and down, and in this way we can contract simply with a company for a year and then reassess, project what our needs are gonna be. So uh, there are some advantages at times, just um, that would be one of them. Any other questions? Thank you. This will be on the agenda on the 25th. So then moving on to Human Resources Employee Handbook. <coughs> Melissa. All right, I'm gonna close out reports quickly. Um, so as I brought to you in the past, I have some additional 
changes to the employee handbook. Now, what you'll see in your packet tonight is not necessarily language changes, more of a formatting, um, but as we have dedicated to bring all changes to the board, I present these to you this evening. So um, we have gone through each part and to help it, um, help it be easier for employees to go through the handbook. On the cover of each main part page, we've added um, some definition to more clearly define what that part applies to for staff. So for part two, you'll see the statutory reference, um, but to make it easier for employees, we have declared that it's teachers, nurses, etc. cetera. Um, the second item that we've done is in the appendix, we've inserted um, some af more effective dates. We've added some other items throughout um, the, that were included previously in the table of con prior to the table of contents in the handbook. We've moved those to the back to the um, appendix section. Um, we've added the effective dates were added to the salary schedules for the hourly and the teachers. Um, just so it doesn't state the school year, but what the actual effective date was of those salary schedules. Um, and then within the table of contents, we've added some tips for navigation through that table of contents. So to help people as they're going through, if they find a section they want to advance to, they don't have to scroll through the whole document. We've added in there that they can just simply click on the word of um, the section that they're wanting to go to and it takes them directly to that link. So. Simple changes, but presenting them to you. Are there any questions? Any questions? And so you're just bringing this, will that need board action? At this point, yes, At we are bringing everything that is changing, so. Well, we have stated previously, if you have any thoughts on some standards that you would wanna give us uh, so that we are not bringing everything to you. Uh, we certainly are open to, to that, but as of now, we will continue uh, to do it, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Then moving on to board member reports and discussions, I'll call on school board <coughs> members in the order of roll call for any comments or committee reports. Mr. Dunlap. Lucky me. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for showing up tonight. The Project Live program, uh, near and dear to my heart. I, I really enjoy having those people here. Um, nice to see Brianna get some recognition from the middle school students, and, and well deserved. Um, <clears throat> I'll also make a comment on I've been to a lot of middle schools and grade schools in the last year for, uh, for different reasons, but almost every school I go into, when you walk in, I notice I can pick up. Uh, uh, guest Wi-Fi and I can establish myself in the, with the Wi-Fi and I can go about my business and even at Caledonia I went to the student that was working the concession stand there and I said what's your password to your guest Wi-Fi he gave it to me and I went about my business now I went to a presentation uh, the musical at um, Sand Lake Elementary I had my turn my phone on and up pops a guest Wi-Fi I thought, well, how cool. We're getting to the point where I can pick that baby up. I wouldn't ask the principal what the password was. He says, I don't have it. <laughs> he said, I'm not allowed to get on it. And I, I just made my prove my point that I hope this, this the <laughs> Wi-Fi thing gets going faster and we get it up to speed and we get up to where we need to go. The more you visit the other schools and see what they have going as far as Wi-Fi and um, being able to connect, um, we're a long ways behind. We need to catch up in a hurry, I think. It's, every school I go into, you turn on your phone and it says Wi-Fi guest. That, that just amazes me and you, you can't do it in Pullman yet. But we're gonna, right? <laughs> um, we, we were talking about, too, too, we were talking about continuous improvement plan. Um, being a, again, being a teacher of continuous improvement and lean, lean processing, and, and again, it's a, it's a private sector. Continuous improvement is something that should be done when you have everything else under control. When you have dealt with the issues, you have used your resources effectively to deal with the issues at hand and deal with the problems you have on hand and resolve those issues and made things stable and under control, then you look at what you can do in addition to make to, to go, on, go on farther than your goals that you already established. And 
where you want to be in, in a couple of years. So be careful about, about using continuous improvement to stack more, to Brianna's point, stack more things on top of, of teachers and what needs to be done. Continuous improvement is improvement above and beyond when your issues are resolved and everything is under control. Uh, in, the, in the statistical world, it means that if you know everything is under control, the scrap, scrap yield is where you need it to be, the students are getting the grades they need to get, everybody, everybody's needs are being met, et cetera. Then you say, okay, we accomplished that. Now, what can we do to continuously improve upon that? So just be careful about stacking too much on top of, um, just for the sake of getting something in the continuous improvement book, make sure it's useful. And, and that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gittins. Yeah, I think I can continue to talk about Gary, Gary here. When continuous improvement isn't needed, then you should recognize that too and don't stack something on just because you want to stack something on. Continuous improvement is just what it should be, just continuous if it's needed. Okay, uh, Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I just wanted to thank the um, all the people who showed up at our meeting tonight and all the just the the good things that we saw tonight at our meeting to see the the Zitlow family's contributions and to see um, Mrs. Kessler and Mrs. Werschofen and the presentation that they gave and to see all the kids in the audience and you know donations being made and and presentations being made by staff members that are excited about what they do. It, it was something really nice to come into tonight and listen to. It kind of gave me hope. Um, Kate and I are going to Madison tomorrow night so that on Wednesday we can go to um, Wisconsin Association of School Boards um, legislative day at the Capitol where we can argue with legislators and try to get more funding for public schools and um, <laughs> try to get our point across and fight for what we need so it's a kind of you fight and one step forward and two steps back and but it is kind of nice to get a reward every once in a while like coming into this meeting tonight and leaving feeling pretty good so um, I just wanted to thank everyone that showed up tonight and then I also wanted to get a little plug in for the <laughs> Renaissance celebrity waiter dinner that if anyone would like to go to the I, and I'm using the term celebrity really, really loosely. They, they, they'll pretty much take anyone. And I, I like to waitress, so um, every year I help out. And um, it's to raise money for Renaissance, which rewards kids who do good things academically at the high school. It's a really, really good time, and it's held on Thursday, March 21st, which is in about a little over a week. It's $30 a ticket, which includes a fantastic dinner at Drugan's and thir or, uh, 30, you can tell I'm not a golfer, <laughs> 18 holes of golf. <laughs> and the 18 holes of golf by itself is worth $33. And that pass for golf is good with no restrictions anytime. So, and all that for $30 and a night of entertainment. It is so fun, I guarantee it. That it's jam packed with people you will laugh your head off. It is, it's, it's just a blast you have to go so if anyone would like to buy tickets you can sit at my table you can sit at any one of 10 or 15 different tables tickets are available at the high school office and um, you have to buy them in advance though so they're going fast as you can tell so <laughs> anyhow um, it's for a really good cause if you would like to go and you'll probably see administration sing School yes, song. Don't yes, say yes. Born. We like to do goofy things to raise money for tips, and all the tips go to Renaissance. So it's for a really good cause. So come on out and help out our school district. And Thank you. That is all I have. Thank you. This is Mayor. Um, student achievement hasn't met since last time we talked about that, so I don't have a committee report. But I've gotten wind that this might be Brianna's last meeting due to. Um, some trips that you have that are really exciting coming up. And, and with that said, I want the public to know and I want Brianna to know um, that you're just remarkable. Um, I've gotten to know her very well this year and, and we've met and had lunch and I've picked her brain and she's picked my brain and the amount of energy and intelligence and joy in you has just been a gift for us. I think it's been a great learning year for you and and um, yeah I think 
Probably. I mean, we were both sworn in on the same day, so we're like newbies together. So um, you really, really will be missed. And uh, whoever follows in your shoes, you know, I, I um, they need to be like size 16 shoes. But <laughs> thank you so much for, for everything that you've given the district. Very, very much. Thank you. Ms. Mr. Menninger. Um, I, I just want to piggyback on that. and. Um, I've had a chance to watch the, the student representatives for quite a few years going back to even before my time on the board, my son sat in that chair. Um, I've never seen a representative like you. It's been fantastic for the board um, and for the school district. So thank you for all you've brought to these meetings. A um, few other comments here as well. As, as I came in this morning, I, I, or this evening, it feels like we've been here a while. <laughs> came, came here this evening. The first thing I said, it's going to be a great night. Yeah, it is. And as I looked yeah. out into the audience and saw all those students out there, I knew it was going to be a great night. Every time we have students come to the board meetings, I get fired up. It really reinvigorates why we are here. It's great to see the project live, our state champion, the Ed Zitlow Foundation, and then just hearing about the Teen Center, just so much positive energy to get the meeting started. Um, you just knew it was going to be a good night when the, the students are here in the building. So certainly encourage them to keep coming to board meetings. It's, all, it's always fun when they do. A um, couple of other things is uh, I was out this morning shoveling snow and lamenting that I had lost my hour of sleep somewhere <laughs> along the weekend. Um, I realized again that our kids were once again standing in the dark at the bus stops and you know the daylight savings time was extended earlier and later a few weeks ago um, I have concerns you know it used to be April to October when I was younger now that it's March to November I think it puts our kids out there in the dark in the morning and that's always a concern to me um, so just everybody be safe out there um, on a positive note for, for some of you spring sports, soon underway, I looked at the schedule tonight. I think the first spring event is uh, March 16th, and the first home event is just three weeks away, weather permitting. So, um, you know, it's uh, signs of spring, and I, I know practice is underway. Uh, two other quick things was to Yes Holman yesterday. Great to see all the great things Holman has to offer um, in the high school, and good to see all that. And I uh, wanted to extend my condolences. Holman lost a good friend here this last week with the passing of Barry Burleson, so. Thank you. Mrs. Treadway. Well, I can't say any more than everyone else has said about what a great evening it's been and a wonderful evening of recognition and appreciation and also support. Um, and thank you, Brianna, also. I didn't know it was your last evening. Otherwise, you maybe would have done something a little more official, but um, thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. Well, and I do think we're going to ask her to come back even past her official time on the board so that we can make an appropriate presentation to you, if you wouldn't mind. I think in April you'll be able to come back, late April or the next meeting. So, And it's always the president's prerogative to go last, but I'm going to leave that honor to you tonight. And I just have a, a couple comments, again, echoing what the rest of the board has said. What a great pleasure it has been. Um, having you serve on the board. You've always pushed us to a different level and, and to remember that we are lifelong learners as well as trying to provide that learning opportunity for our students. So I thank you for that, always having that in the forefront of your thoughts. Um, so thank you. And like I said, we do want to have you come back and to do an appropriate presentation. I n would mention that um, thank you to Kate and Anita um, for taking time out of your schedule for going um, and learning more and having that opportunity for feedback because that always can have an impact and um, again reinforces that it's not just something that we're going to complain about but people are going to actually actively take time out of their schedule and um, do those sorts of things. And then a reminder that next week Right, next week we have the candidates forum mm -hmm. and um, in, would invite the community to come out or to watch it um, on Monday night. Um, it's always a big step to put your name on the ballot for office and um, I would ask that you be considerate and take some time out to come forward and ask those candidates questions and just show them that you are interested as well. So it's the community's opportunity to come out and, and show their interest. And so that's all that I have. Oh, well, I can do that. Well, I'll just mention this. Um, under the personnel report, I would also note 
that Neil's um, departure from the district, this will be his 13th year and he is retiring 10 years at Sand Lake and three years with the, the 4K program. So thank you, Neil, and um, we wish you only the best. So, Brianna. I vote nay. <laughs> <laughs> nay. Okay, well. I have quite a few list of thank yous here, but I'm going to try to get through them as quickly, or not as quickly as possible, but um, just efficiently, because I know the bachelor is on, if any of you. <laughs> <laughs> you um, are in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, first of all, I'd like to start out by saying congratulations to uh, Emma Madison for making it state, um, to the girls hockey team for winning state. Um, I know. Michael Ryan, I can't remember what, I think he placed like sixth in the state for bowling or something for the H HHS bowling club, so I wanted to say congratulations to him. Also, um, I know we have several parents of NHD students here who are um, moving on to um, uh, regionals this week, so congratulations to Thomas and Taylor for that. That's very exciting. Um, and uh, next I'd like to move on to my thank yous here. Um, first, I would have to thank, obviously, the school board. Um, thank you for having me in this position and listening to my ideas and teaching me so much a about how to ask good questions and critically analyze material and be an advocate for the community. Um, education is something I'm very, very passionate about, um, and so is politics. So, And I'm going to cry just thinking about it, but <laughs> it's that kind of advocacy that I want to get into when I'm older. Um, I have to thank Gary, especially for your kind words last week. Um, that meant a lot to me. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm scrolling. <so. laughs> it's like three pages long. <laughs> okay. And thank you to all the board members, really, um, just for the work that you do. And I've come to admire many of you um, and the work that you've done. Um, Thank you to Dr. Carlson. Um, you're an amazing person, and I've really come to admire you as a human being. Um, just your honesty and your willing to work with me um, and just who you are has become someone who I really look up to. Um, Mr. Bear, I have to thank you, too, for meeting with me over the um, course of the year here um, and listening to my different ideas and uh, sharing opinions back and forth. Um, and just helping me out with different things throughout the year. Um, Mr. Clark, I have to thank you for putting up with me <laughs> because you've been the brave one that has sat next to me for the entire year. <laughs> and um, we have passed notes back and forth and I've, you've let me ask you questions about everything and you've recommended wonderful books to me which have made me think and really have promoted me to become a better leader. So I thank you for that in your involvement in the school district. Um, I'm going to, I have quite a few people on here, but if they're not here, I'm just going to send them an email. Um, but I have uh, Jason Austin, um, Mike Gasper, I have to give them a big thank you too for being such great leaders in the school district. Um, Jan Wee, thank you very much for your persistence with this technology issue. I know this has been something you've been working on forever. <laughs> it's something that has been a dream of yours and something you've been pushing for. And it, I know that can be hard when um, you have all these dreams and all this passion for something and you don't see it happen right away. So thank you for sticking with it and all the hard work that you're doing with that. Um, thank you, too, to Melissa um, and Human Resources over here. Um, thank you for your kindness. I know there's been a couple of times when you stepped aside and had conversations with me, and that's meant a lot to me. Um, in addition, I have to thank you, too, um, just for something smaller that you did uh, when you helped out with managing Lois's whole retirement party. Um, just those acts of kindness are really what make the world a different and a better place. And that is something that one of my, something that I admire most about people is their kindness. And that's something I admire about you. And then overall, thank you to all those who are involved in the school district and the administration. Um, just to move on to my teachers here, I'm going to um, name some names and then I'll um, say thank you to a few specific people. But thank you to Brenda Swoboda, 
um, Andy Dipkuski, um, Madam Custer, Ron, Rhonda Rayburn, she's the one who um, helps with the student board position, uh, so I wouldn't be here without her. Um, Miss Burgum, Nick Strasser, Michelle Wench, Mark Wall, and Troy Birdsong. Um, I have to give a big shout out to Ruth and Hannah Schulze, the two Holman Historical Society members who inspired the school board outreach program. Um, I had lunch with them one day in June, and Ms. Schulze says, you know it would be the coolest thing in the entire world? <laughs> <laughs> and she went on to talk about it, and so I took her idea from that. So I have to give her um, credit for that. And as of recently, I met an amazing person by the name of Greg Wagner, Dr. Wagner at UWL, and I am throwing him on the list too, because I, I, I don't know him too well yet, but he's gotten me involved with some community advocacy projects um, down the road here, and I have a feeling that'll lead me into the next phase of my life, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, oh, thank you to Steve Doyle, Jill Billings, and Jennifer Schilling for representing us. We are so lucky to have them as representatives, and I'm excited to join that family down in Madison next year. Um, I also need to thank my family, whom I love more than anything in the world, and they have always been there for me, and they always will be for me. Uh, my brother and sister are my best friends, and my dad is my leadership role model, and he's where I get um, a lot of my inspiration from. Um, also, my mother has taught me how to be a good woman, or a great woman, so I have to thank her for that, too. Next, um, I, have to th I have to thank my second family, and I wonder if he's even here, is Charlie LaVazetta. No, he's not? Oh my gosh. He's the cues to be the camera guy. Um, his family, and I go back a while, a ways, but they have been a um, great influence on my life, and they've helped me out with a lot of the school board issues. We've sat down and talked about things, and uh, his mom is very involved in the schools, <laughs> very involved in the schools, <laughs> and she absolutely loves it, and she's a very inspirational woman in my life. Um, I have to say thank you to Emmy, and I didn't catch her friends' names, but just for coming forward and um, saying thank you to me. That was unexpected and a very nice surprise. Um, and I can't wait to see her as our student future um, <laughs> student representative. And lastly, I need to thank Lori Kessler, my mom, Lisa Collins, Kristen Larson, Kate Mayer, Dace McAndrews, and Karen Rooney for being some of the most influential people in my life. Um, you all have one thing in common, and that is your appreciation for people and your love for life and you have all taught me how to become a better leader woman and especially a better person um, you have given me a direction in life inspired me and have shown me how to be a great human being um, just a little bit over here uh, Kate uh, I've gotten to know you over the past year and it's been you have become a very very influential person in my life and have helped me figure out where I want to go and I know that you're going to be a lifelong friend of mine and I'm very very grateful to have met you so thank you um, another person that I need to give a big shout out to is to uh, Miss McAndrews and she's the person who heads the National History Day program and without her I probably wouldn't be here at all because she has been someone who well she was probably one of the first people besides, well, my parents were always encouraging, but she told me basically that I could do anything I set my mind to. And she influenced and inspired me to become a more appreciative person. And she showed me how to appreciate others. And that's something that I have come to value most of my life is that ability to appreciate people. And I found that once you can master the skill and art of appreciation, just loving people and being kind to people and finding joy in small things in life, that the doors just open up for you <laughs> and the people you meet are phenomenal. And that's one thing that she really taught me and it, I was able to just see the world in a different light. I was able to become a more um, active person and involved and um, that was that's one thing I really have to thank her for um, and as I complete my last home and school board 
speech as your student representative, I encourage you all to love everyone. Um, live a life of appreciation, kindness, and compassion. It makes all the difference in the world and it makes all the difference in your life. Um, as educators, our goal should be to provide opportunities for our students, present ourselves from limiting potential, and make the world a better place through the future of our children. And I think that's why we're all here, is to make the world a better place. Well, Brianna, that's why we are here. So thank you so very much. And it's nice that you pulled out information about your teachers because studies show that having one adult influence um, in a child's life is what really can matter. And you've shown that you've had a number of them. And it just confirms what we know here about our staff and faculty at home and that they're good and great people. So thank you. Hey. Well then, moving on to board meeting schedule. The, as was mentioned, Wednesday is WASB Day at the Capitol. March 18th is the candidate forum. We have a board meeting on the 25th. Also on April 4th, we have a CESA 4 legislative forum. April 8th, we have a board meeting. April 18th is the new board member orientation. And April 22nd is another board meeting. And I know we are trying to finalize a board meeting date um, here for March, an additional board meeting date. Additional um, or administrative rules and policies for review, school volunteers, um, and they were in your packet. I don't know if they're up for discussion, correct? I might be, yeah, this is for a review. And just let me clarify, you'll notice that 353.1, actually you reviewed it over two years ago. And it, it for a variety of reasons, it has not been addressed then at the committee level. Um, since then, we know that 815 is actually on the list this year as a should, not a must, but a should. And as we have looked at those two, um, I have hopes that maybe we can, there's so many similarities, a lot of things in common, that maybe we can do some work with those two together. So I brought the other one back. Um, in case, because it has been a while for you to make any kind of comments before these two would go, and then uh, the recommendation would be at this point the Personnel and Governance Committee, um, unless the board has a different direction. When we first discussed it, or it discussed it in 2010, was, was that when we had that discussion about background checks and then um, if there were felonies or other mm. things? You know, we, I just remember, recall that discussion, and I know it was kind of a, a mixed bag on what's being done. If every felony then eliminates them, or felonies 10 years ago, or do we do a time? So do you want to very good, time? Very good memory. Thank you. Uh, this is something that, um, this has not been shelved since then. We've been working on it as we can, just administratively, giving some thought to it uh, before bringing it back. You're exactly right. We. We're trying to, uh, we're going to have a lot of work to really look at our process. I know um, before Lois uh, ended her time that this was one of a project she was working on of really pulling a lot of volunteer policies from other school districts so that when we brought it to committee, we'd have some information that that group could work on. So you're right. Uh, that's just one example, a piece of it as far as the background check. Um, right now, we, we check everyone. Mm -hmm. And, but we do it one time. One time and you're in. And so uh, there's a couple of issues right there that I think that we need to, to look at and address. So this is not going to be a, uh, a short one, an easy one. We I tell you, this is such a, a special, uh, you all know as far as the value that our volunteers bring. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything to continue our partnership and with all our volunteers, we have so many. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that, whether it's health and safety, whatever the case may be, we want to make sure that we have a, a process that, that works well for us. And so anyway, uh, that's why these two are coming back. I, I hope at least at the committee level we can begin to look at these 
this year. We'll see. Okay. So any input or discussion? Okay, then I would move on to the consent agenda items. Are there any items that we would like to consider separately? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, including the personnel report, financial claims and accounts, second reading of great advancement and acceptable use policies, summer school and summer school. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 And against nay, motion carries. Executive session, Mrs. Treadway. I move that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing the district administrator's performance evaluation. Is there a second? I'll second it. And then roll call vote, please. Gary Dunlop? Yes. Joe Gittins? Yes. Cheryl Hancock? Yes. <coughs> Jaginski? Yes. Kate Mayer? Yes. Women? Yes. And Mike Yes. Okay, we will take about four minutes and come back into closed session at 9.